Okay, much better. So I'm a professor at the University of Massachusetts in the College of Information and Computer Sciences. Um, I'm going to do kind of the opposite of what Janet did, but you know, maybe not, because I really appreciate what she's saying, and I know that's the end game. Somehow I feel, though, that we have to do some of the technology beforehand, understand what we're doing, and then play with wonderful you know, fluffy bees and flowers and history and things like that. So I'm all for that, but I'm going to give you some more hardcore stuff. So our motivation is, what do we do in the moment when we're working with a student and the student is frustrated and, or bored, and we absolutely can see that. Do we increase the challenge? Do we decrease the challenge? Do we pro provide scaffold? Do we provide effective scaffolds? How do we measure changes in the student's affect? Do we capture the micro changes in student affective states? So when, if we were to have systems like Janet described, and kids were playing around, could we detect when they were bored? Could we detect when they were interested? Could we give them the right kind of scaffolding? And that's the kind of work we're going to. And mostly I'm going to stay in a very simple domain called mathematics. And you don't have to worry about you know, whether it's a bee or a flower or a place in the 19th century or the 14th century. But it's the same idea. You still have to worry about whether the student is bored or excited and what they're doing. So um, there's some, reference, some history about studying people and computers. And it turns out that folks have shown that the humans relate to computers in the same way they relate to humans. This is an interesting book by Nass, and he says you kind of protect your computer, you try not to be embarrassed in front of it, you won't let anyone say anything bad to it. You know, it's an, an interesting book about that psychologist noticing that, that we're engaged with our computer. And then it seems that people are continuing to engage in frustrating tasks significantly longer if an empathetic digital response person or th and the character st speaks to them. That's interesting results. In other words, they'll suffer any kind of uh, handiwork you're going to give them as long as somebody's talking to them. And we have also shown that uh, sis uh, students have lower stress level after receiving an empathetic message from a character and that the students recall more when interacting with an artistic agent compared to a scientific agent, and that students re report reduced frustration and more general interest when working with gender-matched characters. So by the way, I'm told that all these slides will be made available. Is that true? So you don't have to worry about uh, copying or anything. So I'm going to give you my summary first, just in case we don't all make it till the end, until lunch, and this is what's between you and lunch. I've, we have been able to show that empathetic characters help decrease students' anxiety and boredom. And we have shown that simple 3D characters instead of 3D, I'm sorry, 2D characters instead of 3D characters work well with students. So we all know of a system where somebody has this big character 3D and does natural language and all that heavy material and heavy equipment. And it turns out if you did 2D and you don't do natural language, you get very good results also. So you can do it with not natural language processing, et cetera. Uh, let's just, and then growth mindset messages, and I'm going to show you what those are in a minute, it provides a boost in student learning. And then there's one here that's really interesting. We have shown that when we give the students simple success failure comments, in other words, we say, yes, that's right, no, that's wrong, this, it seems to be harmful to students and compared to other conditions. In other words, uh, they, they get, start getting bored more quickly and they get frustrated more quickly if you say yes, no, yes, no. It makes sense, but a lot of the systems do exactly that. Right. So then there's a lot more history that I'll just show you a bit of. Uh, confusion, of course, is associated with, lear oh no, this is what's unknown. The first one is uh, not intuitive. The, the last two are intuitive. Boredom reduces tax performance, ta task performance, and boredom increases ineffective behaviors such as gaming. And confusion, however, is sometimes associated with learning under certain conditions, and that Art Grazier has shown that. In other words, you've got to do some, con you often have to be in the state of confusion before you make a breakthrough and you start learning. So there's been a lot of work on the relation between emotion and uh, learning. So I'm going to talk about a system that I'm sure some of you have seen, and it has a little character on the right, and it gives students, actually, we now have almost all the mathematical problems needed to get between grades 5 and grade 10. And this is according to the United States standard where there is a common core. And so we have been putting in all the problems that are needed to test children, uh, train children also for passing that test, unfortunately, because that's what we're doing in my country. But I'm going to show you what the character says because this is the part we find helpful. So I told you that uh, 
affective characters can be more sympathetic to s students and they can be, achieve better results if they have a character like that. Certain students can. And these are the, what we call growth mind co comments. And this is from um, uh, right, Carol Dweck, who used to be in New, York, in New York. She's now from Stanford. And it's sentences that talk about how the mind is malleable. And if you want to learn math, you can. And you don't have to think that you don't have the math gene. You know, some students think that. So did you know that when we learn something new, our brain actually changes? It forms new connections to help us solve similar problems. And then, or it might say, there is no one single way to solve something, no matter how you learn, challenging ourselves is putting the effort in. And learning math is like riding a bike. We have to practice a lot before getting good. So these are sentences, as I said, that Carol Dweck came up with. She says, are better for students to continue to be engaged in learning and to move ahead. And we try to have characters of different cultural backgrounds and of different emotions. And they're speaking, actually, a little words. So these are just 2D characters, quite simple. Uh, let's see if we can show you. Wait a minute. Nothing happening. OK. Uh, what am I doing? I'm trying. You're on your computer. I'm on my computer. Thank you. <laughs> Would be nice to know what I'm doing here. OK. <laughs> but sometimes the computer wins. Sometimes I win. These are the hard questions that I like. There's an opportunity to learn. Just yeah, click on the help button. There's an opportunity to learn. It said, uh, yeah, it's, I'm not going to do this for a long time. Just a little bit. And I'll do that one again. These are the hard questions that I like. There's an opportunity to... Yes. Okay, one moment. We'll try. Thir third time is a charm. These are the hard questions that I like. Thank you very much. <laughs> There's an opportunity to learn. Let's click on the help button. Okay, and... Good job. See how taking your time to work through these questions can make you get the right answer? Let's read again what the problem is asking. Those who know Ivana Roya can tell there's a little accent in there. And let's see what else he's saying. Okay, that's all he says. And she's studying. Okay. So it turns out that these kind of activities, which are really small and not, uh, doesn't, don't require 3D, don't require natural language, are very helpful. Again, I said to certain kinds of students, what we do is measure the students' cognitive and affective, affective tri attributes, their skills, their motivation, their engagement. I'll show you later how we measure motivation and engagement. And we try to offer appropriate, timely interventions and try to measure the impact. And what we have found, and again, this is, more for, let me just say, females and students with disabilities have these kind of charts. It turns out males, especially young males who are high achievers, hate having those characters talk to them. They draw ears on them, they mute them, they do everything they can to get rid of them. But there's half the population that really uses them and they happen to be of the lower achievement level. So in terms of, we've measured these things and we, ah, uh, okay, God help us. Is it just going to come up again if I do it again? <laughs> All right. Let's try. Um, so here's the more frustrated. We find that if there's no learning companion, children often get most frustrated. This is before you start, during the time you're working with the system. OK. Uh, what do I do with this? I, uh, do you have any hints? It's going to just keep coming, right? I'm going to need it. I don't need it, no. OK, so we can okay. just yeah. switch off. Okay, if it comes up again, I'll let you. I will just say. And you. Oh, got it. That's that one. Yes, that that will do. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay, so we test the kids before, after, and while they're working, and there seems to be less frustration again with students who are usually the lower achievers, and so, again, there's also increased interest because we ask the children about their interest. And again, the interest seems to go up while they're working with the system and afterwards, and it lasts for a little while. And then we've also measured confidence of the students. And it turns out at least a high math ability, low math ability, no learning companion, learning companions, et cetera. And again, the confidence goes up for certain people. 
Okay, so what we're about is the following. We're trying to detect student emotion, and then the ultimate goal, of course, is to remediate. I mean, there's a lot of people who are working on models of emotion, and you're hearing some of them now, but very few people are working on this, which is where we're trying, where I'll show you some systems that we've built. And what we're doing here in terms of peer-based remediation, we're asking children to collaborate with others. This was another thing that Janet mentioned. And games, we're introducing games at the end also. So that we know we have to bring engagement in and we're trying to figure out exactly for which student at what time these uh, uh, remediations are successful. So we used uh, sensors as a lot of people did, uh, using some, some skin galvanizer on the hand, using an accelerometer in the mouse to, uh, so it can tell when you're clutching it tightly. We use pillows on the chairs and we use a camera. And the trouble is there, we went to rural high schools, we worked with students, but you're carrying all these boxes of uh, sensors and then you're putting them on students and you really don't want to do that across the country. So what we want to do is build a model of what that was like and work without sensors. And what happened is interesting is that we looked at all of those sensors, which are here. We looked at how they uh, reflected a student's confidence, frustration, excitement and interest and we find that the camera, you see the, the darker, the bold color, the camera actually does more, has a higher relationship to these, each of these uh, attributes and uh, so it means that you can just use the camera and get out the data about being interested, excited, frustrated and confident, which is great because we didn't want to go around with the seat and the mouse and all that stuff and bringing it to every classroom. So. That Okay, so in terms of the system, um, as I said, we have all these problems and we allow, we support the student in looking at uh, resources that can uh, show example, they can get worked out examples, worked out video, glossary, hints, things like that. And uh, the student, the companion talks to them as I mentioned and they have all the access to all these things. And the, one interesting thing is they have access to something we call My Progress. And this will show them how they progressed in every single math topic. And sometimes, you know, they can, they can choose to either go to that topic or go to further places or go to a totally new topic. So uh, the mathematical models, I'm not going to go into in too much detail, but just to tell you, we, these are the kind of models we use to replace the sensors. Before the tutor, we asked students about their math self-concept, self which is like confidence, we ask about the math value, etc. And then during the system, while they're working on the system, we try to measure their confidence frustration. And then afterwards, we ask them about their self-concept, their did you like it, did you learn anything from it, etc., etc. And then we're putting together all these, all we're doing is trying to find high relationships between a student's emotion, which is in this line, and what the students said before they used the system, and what they said after they used the system. So this is the mathematical model and it actually could be used by other people who are developing tutors so that these other people do not have to go through the same process. And I'm, we, I list it all here, self-concept, math liking, and we have three questions for that and four questions for that, et cetera. And then afterwards we ask them about their perception of learning. Did you learn something? And sometimes people say they learned when we, our, statics, our statistics say they did not learn and things like that. And so this is the final model, but I'm not going to go into detail, but you can see this kind of high correlation, 80.82, 0.72 between these things. So we, and we have tested this. It seems, it seems about 80% as accurate as we, it was with the sensors. Okay, so then the other is to look, think about their self-reports of students, because what we're doing is asking them about their emotion. And here's the kind of sheet we say, how do you feel and please let us know. And they say no, yes, da da da. And then why is that? So uh, until a little while ago, we couldn't do anything with the why is that because we are not doing natural language parsing. But we've started to just look for patterns in what students have said and see how that connects to what they, with what they think about their own emotion. And so what we're asking for them to say is, are you, in terms of joy, are you very excited? Are you very frustrated? Are you interested, et cetera? And then we're asking them to say why. What did they say about it? So as you can see here, it says, because I actually am feel, these are actual statements that kids have typed in, and, and these are the scores they gave down here. And then this is the, what they've said about it, and this is the time, and this is their ID number. And we're taking all these pieces of data and crunching them and looking for categories in them, and that's what I'm showing you. 
I am kind of excited because I am provided a lot of tools that can help me solve the problem. And um, it's too hard. And that person has an interest of three, which is right in the middle. It's okay. When people want to learn, they want to at least have fun while learning. Uh, I got it right because math is light. It is interesting to solving new problems, etc. I'm feeling excited because math is fun. We didn't make these up, this is what the kids are saying. So the question is, can you get material out of what they say to understand their affect more? Um, what we did is, there's, in the past, there's been two major approaches to examining affect. Categorical, each, aff each affect is considered as a discrete category. You know, you're in excitement, then you're in joy, then you're in boredom, blah, blah, blah. And the approach, this is usually used in an IT. So this approach that I'm showing is sort of a dimensional model of emotion. We're looking at the valence, that is, how strongly did they say that they believe in this, and what's the activation, is a high or low. Etc. And I'll show you how we turned it in. We, we prompted for affect every five problems or eight minutes, whichever came first. We asked students to rate their affect. And again, it's that same sheet that you saw before. And what we processed were 450 random responses from 2011 given to five coders, five different researchers. And we, they independently created 10 categories. So, so each of those sentences like, uh, it's too hard, where does that fit? Or, I didn't have enough time. What does, that, what does that really mean? So you don't have to copy down that very word. And they found 10 categories that these sentences fit into. In other words, the students' words were an example of a certain emotion. And each of these coders covered about 70% of all the, res uh, of the resources. So we had three coders use the resulting five schemes to create 10 categories. These are the categories. And what I can say is what we're trying to do is find a category where we can put most of the statements the students say. And this is, I don't know, it's boring, it's easy, it's hard, it's internal, blah, blah, blah. And we were able to put most of those items into those categories. Four coders each coded this 2015 data using 10 agreed upon characters and high inter-rater reliability. And we used this code to see who had the highest agreement with overall. And you can barely see that, I'm sure. But there's a code there. And for, so for everything positive, negative, it did support me, it didn't support me, um, I don't care. And we figured out, these are the relationships, uh, the inter-rater reliability. So it was OK. And then what, get, taking these same categories, I don't know, it's positive, it's negative. We looked at the data from 2015, the data from 2011. What we can say is that somehow the tutor is improving a bit. I mean, I don't know is about the same. But in terms of positive, this, Later date, 2005, had more positive comments. It had fewer negative comments. It had more interest. It had uh, about the same external, and, and that's internal, sorry. It had less boredom, the blue one, et cetera. So we're comparing what students are saying about the system to, from four years ago to last year. And so the tutor seems to be improving in promoting positive student effect. We still, we want this positive effect not only because of the engagement, but because people learn better when they are talking about positive things and uh, about how the, if there's something goes wrong, are they actually blaming themselves or are they blaming external people? And that's what that internal and external is. And then this is broken down. It's a little hard to read all of it. But again, the results are more positive, less negative affect of students, more internal, less external effect like I didn't know it, but I'm learning, as opposed to, no, he went too fast, or no, it's very hard to read, and less boring material. And that, that's the result, and then I'm just showing you some of the numbers here. Boring and boring. And you can see there's less um, of the boring. The boring, 10.3 percentage of reports contained boring in the early days. Now it's only 3.6, but I mean, it's still boring, <laughs> et cetera. I mean, if, if math is boring, can you imagine? We could probably do something much better with games of math. And then, again, these results. What we're trying to do is put this material into categories. For instance, does the positive, is, is positive response in, integrate, is it um, aligned with in, internal or external feelings? And I don't know, is that aligned with anything? Is the negative external aligned with boring and things like that? OK, so many students tend to externalize this affect. Especially when it is negative, they say the problems are too difficult. Again, that's outside of me. It's not my fault. It's that you guys are going too fast or something like that. The population seemed to differ on when they reported the material was hard. 
and by population, we haven't, I haven't, for the, you, I haven't broken it down to gender and to achievement level, but it absolutely does break down that way. The tutor seems to be improving in that. So now I'm going to go on, and this is the same picture, was it? Either you showed, you showed it, Roger? I don't know. Okay, we're again looking at affect, and we, we have a camera on the kid's face, and we can see the eyebrows, I think it was Susan who did it, Suzanne. and you can check the mouth, and we can try to start to say, are you angry, are you happy, are you frustrated? Um, but it's, 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 not ever, it's not done collectively. This is Ryan, somebody people know. There are many methods. I mean, can you have two or three people judging? Here's a folk, say this is a person looking at a math problem. One person might say she looks angry. One person says she looks bored. One person looks she looks frustrated. So there's hardly any agreement there. And um, do we want to have agreement? Do we want these things to be exactly the same? Uh, can you understand how I feel? So what we did was ask students to take little pictures of uh, happy, smiling faces, frowning faces, and put it on a circle where happiness is to the right and pleasant and unpleasant is to the left and surprise is to the top and deactivation to the bottom. These aren't the actual words that researchers use. We changed the words so that a fifth grader could understand them and ask them to put these little stickers on. It's so it says find out what their self, how their self-report agrees with what the researcher says. So we found that the self-report method is reliable but we need to establish a method to measure that reliability because um, there are different methods to do it, but very few people have looked at 50, eighth, uh, seventh graders from two California schools who have done it. The ma majority of them are Latin American, and uh, it's close, they were close to the California median income. And I'll just show you the results. We've got the following stickers, as you can see. Anxious stuff. So they're supposed to put all those down together. And what we found is words based on relevance in education and, and similarity to remote. <laughs> oh. Emoticons based on, um, this is who we took this, this idea from, of doing this experiment, and they have extremes of pleasure and activation, etc. And it turned out the average self-report is quite different. I mean, we have, uh, let's see if I can, we have frustrated and angry down here where we expected more of these to be. And, um, right. and then I can only read, and confidence is up there, which is okay. But for the most part, the students did not agree at all. And they each one put the, 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 uh, the emoticons in different places. So, oh, uh, that's in the wrong place, sorry. So what are we, um, okay, so this was the result, variance of students' placement, and you see there's no agreement. So we took and looked at the action mean, the standard deviation, and the valence by how strong, you know, how far away from the center was it. And we looked at the text or emoticons that we gave the kids. So the thing is, it looks like uh, student reports are not really reliable unless we find a better way to uh, understand what they're saying about their uh, uh, affect. Uh, we assume the results are representative of that, but what does that mean? So there's a lot of work that needs to be done here. One student's high boredom is another student's you know, low confidence. Students don't see affect as fitting into other, what re researchers have shown. And we need to, it's a cheap and easy way, so a lot of folks like to use that because it's cheap and easy, but the high variance makes it not as reliable. Okay, so the next bit I'm gonna talk about, so you've seen how we are detecting emotion, and maybe you believe we cannot detect emotion. So I believe we can. <laughs> Leave it at that, there's still little problems with self-reports especially. But now I wanna move on to remediation, and what do you do? So what do you do when you find the student is really deeply frustrated in the middle of this? or deeply uh, annoyed by what's happening. We have, we have three categories of items that we've been using. Teacher-based, in other words, show the student what the teacher has found out about them. Peer-based, ask students to collaborate with two other people that are sitting beside them. Luckily, we know who's sitting beside you because you all signed in on the computer. And we have some very nice games that we're interleaving when we think a student needs it. I'm only gonna talk about this one, which is teacher-based. Um, and what we're doing is looking at activating emotions, you know, joy, um, uh, joy and interest and et cetera. And then we look at deactivating emotions, and boredom and un lack of excitement. So there's deactivating and there's activating emotion. And a lot of these come from PICRAN. Um, and what we're doing is an experiment with each of these items. And then based on that, 
going to another, putting an aggregate, put these things together. So if we have, we ask people to collaborate, we ask people to look at games, we ask people to look at the results, put that together and see which effect of support for individuals and who is frustrated and who is anxious at the end. And we do that for the deactivating emotion as well. So look at when people are in deactivating, when they're bored and when they lack, have lack of excitement, what do we do? And we're going to test that. And then at the end, we put it all together and activate. What we want is to know what's effective for each individual who are frustrated or anxious or bored or interest, not interested, but each one separately. I mean, if you just say as a blank, we're always going to give uh, people a chance to look at the result, their mastery level, or we're always going to give kids a chance to do games. I'm not sure it's going to work. I want to separate it because I think individuals are different in how they respond to these things. So in terms of the system which we went through, I'm going to show you now the My Progress page, but not, not say much about it. So like others, we're trying to find a page, a, uh, what's the new word, dashboard. Christina was telling me this. New, the dashboard is the idea. Can you show students one page where they will get all the topics that they've been working on? This is addition, this is multiplication, and this is expression. And you, this is your mastery level at each one of these. And if you do well, you, if the system thinks you're doing well, you get a tree growing. If you don't do well, the tree starts to slump, slump over, and you get red peppers on it. And actually, the kids in California, I said we were in a California school, they, were, they did not like it. They thought it was a put down on them because they, their parents are farmers and are in agriculture business, and they didn't want to see flowers. So that, that worked well. So then the student gets to choose. Do you want to continue? Do you want to review this topic? Or do you want to be challenged? And they get to decide. So they could say, I've had two problems here. I don't want any more. And go right to another subject. So there's about 20 subjects down here. And um, they can continue, and they can go backwards and see the last thing again. And the system tries to give them a material. You got the last problem right. Do you want to try more problems like this? This is an untried topic. Would you like to try it? And so the messages here are distinct for every uh, item. And this is a graph from Pikram, who's recognizing that sometimes mastery appears in different ways. You have performance. Is it appropriate for performance? Is the student trying to avoid performing? Are they going towards performing? So there's talk about uh, students who want to perform only, want to show off for other people. And there's others who want to learn. And th that different. Mindset is something that you have to understand when you're giving them material like this. And so we've been looking at this uh, mastery and avoiding performance, etc. And I'll show you. So what we did in terms of that uh, page that, that gives the an uh, a statement about how you're doing, we gave them no access to it, to the student progress page. We gave them a, pre a button that was present. So you could see, you could um, press the button if you wanted to see uh, what you were doing. We prompted them, some students, and then we forced students to see my progress page when students were bored or interested. So there's four experimental conditions, and we wanted to see how it impacted students' emotion and, and also their learning. And the results were uh, that the no button, they weren't able to do it. The mean was around 1.3 in terms of uh, actual learning. The, if the button was present, the uh, mean was 3.1. If we offered it, when they had low affect, then it was 6.0. If we force them upon low affect, it was 8.0. So there's a lot of change here. And it looks like it's good, or it, it improves your learning if you force them. That is, th this thing, this chart comes up just automatically. We confirmed that there were no differences. Oh, wait, and, base, and in terms of baseline interest and excitement as measured by the pre-effect survey. Let me go into that a little bit more. So our current gold standard is the self-report, so we're matching that against what they are doing. We ask the students about their interest level and their excitement level every seven minutes, and I guess I've already talked about that. Sorry, I've got it, a question. So yeah. in the button results, the, the numbers are how so much data, right? Yeah. In the previous slide. Right, previous, right. Right. So when the button was present and they were offered without forcing, yeah. so I, I assume that they actually did press the button as many times as the um, for so, uh, oh. the pressing So I'll tell you, that, that was yet a separate experiment. We actually went through, and there's a huge table about how many times they pressed based on this. So, so in fact, um, these guys where it was hidden, let's see, no button, they, they didn't get to press it. 
But these guys, I think everyone else could do it any time they wanted to because it was on, it's up at the top of the page. And so we have a list, and we did find, yes, that they were pressing it a lot. So they were pressing as much as when they were forced? Mm, yeah, I, I, I have to go back to the data, but it's, I can show you where it's written up. Yeah, yeah, if it's the cause of this effect, yeah, you're right. Okay, so then there's some um, results. We, again, we're, we're create, trying to perfect this model we have of what a student is doing while we think they're interested. So what we're say, or excited, and what we have found co that correlates is with interest, uh, the number of mistakes is down low. You see it's a minus 2.5. And this is uh, showing a hint for the last three problems. So if a person is interested, it does seem like they have number of mistakes is going down and the number of hints is going up. If they appear to be excited, and they is solved means they did solve the problem. In terms of excitement, which is up here, the model is saying um, that they, and these, these are the ones we got positive respo uh, response, responses to. They averaged log time to solve, so we're looking at log time, and the average amount of t log time is really small, 0.017. And did they get, and they gave up, interesting, they gave up, that's not good. <laughs> Means that they gave up, which is that they clicked the button and just went to the next one on this. Oh, it's a negative, I'm sorry, it's a negative on that. So they didn't do that. Okay. I can show you the correct material. Okay, let's go. How to analyze the changes in students' affect from moment to moment. And so we've also been looking at Markov chains. I'm not going to go into a lot of talk about this, but a lot of researchers are using this. And in this case, we're using, we had 10,000 data points with 230 students. Uh, we checked whether the student was in a neutral position, was bored, or was interested. And we did it with four cases, where the button was absent, where the button was present, where the button prompted, and where they were forced with the button. And the only thing I'm gonna point out is that students who, students who didn't have a button, it was absent, it says went 0.06 times where they got interested. In other words, they didn't go to interest very often. But if you look at students who were forced to use the system, they go to interested about 0.18 times. In other words, they're moving to the interested more often. And also, uh, uh, the same is true for excitement. So we're measuring excitement. Where is it? Again, you look at, uh, they went from a neutral state to zero chance of getting excited when they weren't looking at that button. And we found that when you look at that button, they are going 0.23 times to the excited. And they stay in the excited because it has a 0.91. So we're trying to track their emotion and their emotion all through, throughout. And it seems, this seems to correlate well with what we're doing. So how do you compare these Markov chain models quantitatively? You're looking for a probability of following a specific path. And what is the probability that a student will end up excited after three transitions? or four transitions or things like that. We sort of concluded that we have refined a methodology to analyze how specific interventions produce changes in the affect state. And we're looking at randomized controlled trials, model creation, et cetera. We have evidence that the SPSS, uh, it's SPP, which is student progress page, it presents, what? If it's present, instead of absent, it can lead toward interest and excitement. So we're not shooting for an ideal policy, just a policy that works to some extent and is capable for individual students. And I'm not going to say much about peer base. As, as I said, we, students are sitting in the classroom. The system says, do you want to collaborate with the guy next to you? You can say yes, you can say no, and it waits for you to do that. And then when you're finished collaborating, it goes on. And we're starting to get data from that. And we also have games that we're looking at. OK, so there's plenty of questions left if anyone wants to start in in this field. So what if students start excited, bored, instead of neutral? I mean, we, we assume they're all in a neutral state. Uh, let me go back. Can we compute the probability of improving their affect state regardless of where they started? And we look into more detail on internal, external tag, because this is what a student is thinking about whether they can do the work or not, and the relationship between difficulty and affect. And create better, can we create better predictive models for a specific reasons, etc. Lots of these unresolved. So um, there's no clear evidence that, uh, in car oh, that, yeah, I didn't mention that before. There's no clear evidence that when you, the SPP at moments of low affect is better than simply having the button available. 
We did find that, I didn't show you in detail, but a lot of kids get bored when you keep telling them they have to do this, then all of a sudden the boredom goes up because they don't have the autonomy. And uh, you know, that's very important to recognize. Uh, agency, a sense of agency, that they need to feel good about what they're doing, and they weren't when we kept telling them what they had to do. Might be that intervening only based on the last report of affect is not, is not good enough. Intervene after episodes of boredom and maybe make the SPP at moments of boredom um, is not that great for repairing these states. So we still are working on it. So this is our research team, and it's two universities, University of Massachusetts and Worcester Polytech. And I thank them. Okay, and thank you.